and she was in a real dark place. And she said, Athena, I just want you to let you know that my life has totally changed. I keep doing what we practice. Wow, okay. She said, because it's the one thing that helped me the most. Of course, everything else helped as well. When you're in that situation, we throw everything at you. So art therapy, all the things that we mm -hmm. do yeah. on top of medical help. And she said, look, I have a new relationship. I have a new life. I have a new job. I just want to let you know I'm well. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Okay, that was yeah. <laughs> and for well. me, I cried. Well. I really did cry. Well. Well. So for me, that was wonderful. Wow. Well done, Athena. No. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. There's so much suffering that is totally undetectable. And these are very sick people. These people require hospitalization and they're staying there for weeks and months on end. We do have a mental health issue. Really? Yeah, yeah. 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 Especially after the pandemic. That's why there's been a focus of my work, helping people to do the work before it gets to such an extent that you require hospitalization and very intense medical intervention. There's a lot of things, practices that you could do. And a lot of patients after the class or session, they come to me and say, Athena, why don't I know this 10 years ago? Harvest is in London for a special one day event. Here we gather renowned artists, speakers and practitioners who are all inspiring us with their take on this edition theme tools for transformation. I hope you enjoy this interview. Hello, today I am with Athena Ko. She's one of London's leading gong masters the Gong Girl, as she's called, has an extraordinary depth of experience guiding students to a place of focus, mental clarity and calm via meditation and uh, yoga. She also teaches meditation in the psychiatric wards of the Nightingale Hospital. We'll discuss that also. Mm -hmm. Hello, Athena. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being the first one on <laughs> Saturday morning. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, I just love it when we get up and then we just sit down and we have a good, nice chat. You know? <laughs> yeah, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so my first question is, mm. um, I'm very happy to, to, to interview you about uh, the gong bath and uh, we're going to talk about mental health also. But can you describe first the session and why um, is it called a gong bath first when there is no... Um, Nudity or bath water involved. involved. Yeah. <laughs> so gong bath essentially is a commonly known term for sound meditation. So when people hear about sound meditation, they don't really understand what it involves. So gong bath is very accessible as a gong playing and you're bathed in its sound. So that's where the term comes from. But essentially, it's just a sound meditation. What we're doing, like a lot of other practitioners at Harvest, is bringing you back to the present. Yeah. So you're not living in the past, you're not living in the future, you're here. So essentially is a meditation tool. So that's what a sound bath is. Wow, beautiful. And can you talk about the, um, the origins of the gong bath? Has it always been like um, a healing practice, meditation practice? The gongs itself is an overtone instrument. So it has always used in East Asia for ceremonial purposes. So in temples, you use it to summon crowds. You use it to before a ceremony. You use it to announce something that's going to happen. It's used a little bit more sporadically than we do now. We have adopted the gong and make it into a full therapeutic um, tool. Most of the time you see Himalayan bowls being used, crystal bowls or other sound instruments, they use, they use the same principles, basically use it as a sensory guide to take us to that meditative state. So it has evolved, but it has always been there. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Does it remind you, because you've been raised uh, in uh, Hong Kong, yeah. uh, when you had your first experience, we'll talk a bit more about this, but uh, does it remind you your um, childhood in, uh, in Hong Kong, a bit the bath? Oh yeah. Near the gong? Yeah. I mean, the thing is that it's a very integral of our lives, having gongs, bells, like all these boom in a temple and in silence. And another ring, boom, and in silence. It's a call to prayer, it's a call to meditation without it being religious at all. It's part of the practice. Yeah. And it's really much this gong vibration is very close to a monk's chanting. 
uh, whether it's Benedictine monks or Tibetan monks, it's the same frequency actually. We recorded them in their scientific studies sort of looking into it. So it's the same frequency that brings us into that point of stillness and that point of calm. So for me, it's something that resonates with me and it's something that is very easy to resonate with other people as well. So for me, it's like coming home when I listen to it. Wow. And what's the difference between uh, the gong bath and the uh, normal meditation? I guess the fact that there is no um, language, you talk a little bit maybe at the beginning, but mm -hmm. the fact that there is no language uh, involved in the, in the sound meditation makes mm -hmm. it like more universal or easy to relax? Yeah, well, I teach all sorts of meditation. Sound meditation has been really popular because it's the one of the easiest way of getting into a meditative state. When you meditate, for example, when I teach in a mental health hospital, we are teaching to people with all sorts of different cultural backgrounds. They, their first languages are totally different. If I guide them through with English, it's great, but sometimes the words don't land okay. as well. Yeah. So you, and languages itself, like English or French or like Italian, there's so much already in the, in the words like gender, cultural biases, mm -hmm. like all of these things that we're conditioned to Sometimes words could trigger something depending on what happened to you. So, and there are judgment, expectations. When you hear one word, like finish the sentence, then you are, your conscious mind get in front of the practice. It constantly interferes with you. And there's the human voice as well. The moment I speak to you, I bet whoever's listening to this podcast is saying, oh, where is she from? Oh, it's a female talking. Um, she sounds a little bit American. A little... So a lot of our conscious mind starts coming yeah. between our practice. And for sound, A is universal. Secondly, there's no judgment. If you play the note C, it's the note C. If you play the note F, it's the note F. So everyone immediately just drops in. So yeah. it's very effective, it's very in universal. And for me, it's a very pure way of using your senses, which is your hearing. Your hearing never stops as well to guide you. And so even if you fall asleep, it's totally fine. Okay, and it yeah, happens. It happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. But if you fall yeah. asleep and someone shout fire, you will jolt right, up yeah. and say, so that's why your hearing is so amazing. Your eyes okay. close, a lot of the senses close down or go into rest mode, but your hearing is always there. I mean, it's a ma matter of survival that our hearing is there, but also it's wonderful if we can utilize it as a tool to yeah. take us to somewhere nice. So why yeah. not? So taking to, um, people to somewhere nice, how do you uh, guide them? How do you evaluate during the session? Is there like a, mm -hmm. yeah, how are you going? I think for a practitioner or for a facilitator, for me, is to go in first with no judgment, no expectations. What we our facilitators have a practice ourselves. And for me, when I start playing A, we start with breathing exercise. And I normally have a chat with the people attending. I'll assess the room, read the room a little bit and see where people's energies are in, depending okay. on the time of the day, morning, evening, middle of the week, weekend, what the setting is, whether we're in a beautiful resort. And, Empire or whether we're in an urban setting and what people are going in going to afterwards so you need yeah. to take all to all those things into consideration okay. first so the setting yeah and then when they start lying down then it's very interesting the body never lies so <laughs> once you start playing then you can see eye movements if they don't have an eye mask over them okay then you can see the eye movements i mean i can see a lot with the reflection of my gong can see fidgety movements discomfort if there's anything tears sometimes yeah. involuntary movements i do have students which has quite dramatic involuntary movements and it's totally normal they can't help it because they're just doing the work that need they need to yeah. do how the gong sounds work is uh, the vibrations the sound lead us into a state where we start to entrain with the sound of the gongs. So if I play a really rhythmic beat, you start bobbing up a lot, yeah. up and down with the rhythm. And that's what happening to not just you consciously with the head, but every single cell in your body. So that's sort of like that kind of energetic movements, like physically, mentally allows you with the nervous system and everything allows it to recalibrate. So it allows you to do whatever you need to do on the mat. And that's the beauty of it. So for me, it's just assessing, it's a feedback system. So I have to be really open and mindful as I go along. And sometimes I have a plan and <laughs> it never goes according to the plan <laughs> yeah, because guess. you never know who's gonna turn up on the mat. So yeah. that's why I find this work 
always fascinating and always very enjoyable. We've been talking about this, like my mm. first sound meditation, I think I was not ready for that and I was mm. a bit, uh, oh, maybe I, I had done a breath work the night mm -hmm. before, so I was not in the mood again to do a uh, sound meditation yet yeah, to do the work. <laughs> Good thing for now. <laughs> but some people uh, found it a bit, um, mm -hmm. I had this story of um, yeah, a sound um, meditation that didn't go well because people were like expecting like the sound to heal them straight away mm -hmm. and uh, they were a bit bored. So yeah. what am I doing here? Yeah, My yes. back is hurting yeah. or like this is really not comfortable. Do you have to be ready prepared? Do you have to, to have a bit of uh, preparation when you are uh, doing Going this into this yeah. kind of work? I mean, preparation never hurts anyone, mm. but you don't have to be prepared per se. I always think like, for me, I was totally not prepared for my first gone path. I walked in not knowing what to expect, but I was tired enough to have no expectation yeah. and <laughs> no good. judgment throughout. Yeah. The worst thing is to judge yourself where you're like, Oh, what am I supposed to feel now? Oh, is she going there? Is she going that? What's playing now? I'm, that is lethal, but it's okay. It's part of the process. It's like any practice. When you go into it, there's a certain level of discomfort, mm -hmm. and then it gets easier and easier. And for me, I just think, come with an open mind. The worst come, worst come to worst, you just lie down for an hour and just rest a little bit. Yeah. So, and that's the best way to approach any practice. Uh, forcing anything is never a good idea. Yeah. So when they say like, uh, trust your body, your body is going to take you where you need to go. Yeah. That's what you think. Yeah. yeah. Just trust yourself. Yeah. It's, and just trust, trust whoever is facilitating. I mean, you can judge, okay, maybe this teacher is not for me, but honestly, once you're in it, just be in the moment. Yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. You go. And you were mentioning your first experience. So I'm very curious <laughs> about that because in your mm. past life, uh, you were a um, hedge fund uh, manager. Yeah. And then what happened to you? So you've been uh, taken to this uh, gong class with a friend? Mm, yes. So it was a long time ago. It's like almost, I said 15, but it's now 20 years. Okay, uh, yeah, time goes. Now, yeah. time goes. I was missing five years. But anyway, um, so my friend, I, I was very alpha. I'm over analytical. I'm a big thinker. I'm a big planner. And I, I am very intense in many ways. And my friend's like, oh, and she's like, Athena, let's try this. My friend said, this is amazing. I was like, what is this? It's a gone bath, it's a sound meditation thing. I was like, okay, whatever. We were living in New York then. So I went to West Village into this little room. I lie down and someone played a gongs and I just feel, suddenly my body just fused to the floor and tears just came out of me. Wow. Just flow, it's yeah. not like, big ugly sobs, yeah, but yeah, it just yeah, flows. Yeah. It's like a dam that has been released. Okay. And I was just like, I have, I was lucky that day I was just like not in control. I don't need to be because probably I was so exhausted. I was working 20 hours mm -hmm. a day, six days a week, seven days a week. So I just like let it go. And that was that moment you feel you're suspended in the air and the whole hour just disappear like that. And afterwards I was like collecting myself back up and I was like what happened and I was like my god I feel great I was lighter it's like a whole load off my body a lot of tension physically I could feel off my body mentally I'm clearer I'm at peace yeah and that was wonderful I was at peace I had well at that age 25 someone would say I have everything in the world but at that point I was like oh I'm whole that's crazy yeah isn't that yeah amazing so I was like, okay that and that leads me to a whole journey the curiosity and of course I have that intellectual intensity to go deep into all these practices and that leads to where we are now because you were like to put back a bit of context for people who don't know you um, mm -hmm. I think yeah would you qualify yourself as an overachiever you were going to Harvard Oxford uh, yes the best in your class a hedge fund manager the woman in yeah. the room uh, yeah it's it's it is. Do you think you needed this? Yes. Need I'm, I think for a lot of us, we're conditioned to do our best. Mm -hmm. uh, we're conditioned to strive. It's the hustle. I hate that word, that, that word hustle. Yeah. Um, so I have been on that track, like doing things like you have to get your degree, you have to have a good job, you have to maybe get your first place, have a good boyfriend, have like tick, 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 the list goes on. And are you on track to get engaged and get married and have kids and all of that? 
So I think I was on track. Yeah, ticking all the boxes. All the boxes okay. were doing really well. But knowing that I was not exactly happy all along, overachieving, over over stretching in every single direction and neglecting everything else my body is telling me. Yeah. Like you're you're looking great but you're actually not eating well. You're looking great, you're 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 in a size 0 or whatever I was and people find you attractive but you're not finding yourself attractive. You're not looking at yourself in the mirror saying, "Oh, I'm I like this person." <laughs> and when you're not there, you're not liking yourself and you're not loving yourself. How can you find someone or know how no this person is genuinely liking or loving you for who you are? It's wow. not a good formula to how wow. you live. So, yeah. That's a radical radical change. It is a radical in change. your life. Uh, what did people, the close one, uh, tell you? Did you have like an extreme reaction? Like, uh, are you crazy when you when you change <laughs> your your path? You know what? I kept it really well hidden. I really okay. <laughs> like I think because it's the times that change as well. It was we're talking about the early 2000s. so I was slipping yeah. these in things in in my gardening leaf. I was this is like I'm going on holiday when I was going to do retreats and going to do ayahuasca and all of that, going to shamanic tribes and. You were still a hedge fund manager at the time. Yes, because I have to make a living. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm very pragmatic. And that's yeah. why I think students and I have this connection because I'm very aware of the fact that we have bills to pay. We have mortgages. We still have a real life. I still need to get here. And I still need to drive a car. I need to find parking. Yeah. I need to pay congestion tour coming into <laughs> London. Okay. Real life happens. Yeah. But you can be spiritual and be, contained, and we be, be contented have that stillness, groundedness, and have love permeates every single thing you do. Have peace permeating every single thing you do. And have compassion permeating everything you do while you're still doing the job, having this human experience. So you need to marry the two. Initially, it was a tough juggle for me because I feel Okay, these are my spiritual friends who might do yoga and go to retreats and go to see my teachers. And these are my friends who might hang out after I've done the hard day of either trading or managing the portfolio talking shop. But the two things are not, not actually mutually exclusive. You can bring what you learn into what you do. And when you're good at what you do, you can implement being conscious, being compassionate, how you invest, how you apply that kind of way of life, way of seeing things into your organization, into your people, well, into your interactions with the people yeah. you work. And that influences other people to do the same work because they see, oh, you're happier and you can still have a real life. Yeah. And that is far more convincing than, for example, a teacher that's revered and has great selling books. How many of those are there there? Is every day when I'm, I think someone very wise once said, when I was young, I want to change the world. And when I'm older, I want to change myself. Because mm. when you change yourself by action, you do things that affect other people. Little things send a ripple across the environment. So you're changing the world by changing yourself. So the most important thing is do the work for yourself. Yeah. Okay, and what was your journey like? You traveled a lot yes, to discover okay. about the, the Gong Bath. Mm -hmm, did mm -hmm. you have like any uh, striking, very important uh, moments in your, in your travels? For me, every moment is striking. Hmm. Um, this is not a cop out to the question because there are so many lineages. For, for us, if you travel, you realize there's nothing new. All of this is so available to us. Some of the greatest teacher I had doesn't charge me anything. Okay. And they said, look, all I want you to do, Athena, is not stay here. Because I said, oh, I could be a nun. This will be wonderful. <laughs> I'm happy here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I said, this is not the point. You take this and teach other people. That's why I got into this work. And for me, all lineages, all the streams end up into the same river, into the same ocean. Wow, OK. Is that pain is inevitable, but suffering is totally optional. What we diagnose as psychiatric conditions, depressions, anxiety, is just living too much in the past, living too much in the future. Our brain overestimating the challenge ahead of us, underestimating our ability to cope. The past trying to change something that we're not in a position to change anymore. The past is the past. The future is not real. And everything is happening now. You do what you can do now to align yourself in the future. So. 
all the work, everyone is just trying to bring you back to the same moment. But because after all the time has passed, culturally we have different languages. And because a lot of times we're teachers as well, they want to make the stories memorable. So we have deities involved, we have religion involved, and that's a very complex subject in itself yeah. with lots of cultural conditioning. Of course, when there are power dynamics, we mentioned this before, there's all sorts of room for characters that are not so not so benevolent. So we have, oh, that's a totally different story. But for me, every single travel is opening my eyes to seeing, oh my God, we are the same. That's my striking point. Different languages, different cultures, different mannerism, different everything. But at the core, we really are the same. No one ever rejects a gesture of kindness. No one ever would think smiling is an awful thing to do. These are universal. It's born. We're born with this. Right. And the more kinder, more compassionate, and more open-minded you are, you realize, oh my God, we are truly one. This sounds so cliche, but we are really, mm -hmm. truly one and the same. And with that vision, will you do harm to your neighbor? Will you do things that's not well for other nations, other societies? I mean, a lot of the problems we see on the newspapers will be gone. Because if you hurt your, the person next to you, you're hurting yourself. With so much wisdom now that you have, uh, when you go back to teach to um, hedge fund managers or people from your previous <laughs> life, like what do you want to teach them, to give them from uh, all your wisdom that you have now? I think the biggest thing I've learned is to be humble. I'm not here to tell anyone what to do or teach. They are my teachers. Okay. And just from the daily interactions, I see the challenges. And it's just from your own way of being and just maybe the way I deal with a very negative comment or a negative interaction that suddenly triggers something. Oh, it could be like that. It could be rather than like going into this very intense negotiation where we're killing each other, there could be a third way. And so from that, mm -hmm. you send a ripple. So I just think sometimes it's wonderful when you said, uh, oh, you're a wonderful teacher now, Athena. You're teaching all these really wonderful venues. You have these students who are so high achieving. The thing is like, these are all intelligent people. I'm not here. And you insult people by saying, oh, you're my student. Everyone's on the path. Yeah. Everyone is my teacher. And my best teacher is my children. They yeah. teach me so much. Tell me about your children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when mm. when you did like your, your first gong bath, did you have them already? Your your daughter? You have two daughters? No, not yet. No. And I'm thankful for that. Okay. Because I think when you have children, I think it's one of those most intense experiences in your life. For sure. And I'm very grateful because then I could very early on my children do have a meditation practice. Yeah, you were not, in a good place, in a better yes. much better place than uh, before. Not consistent. Yeah, but yeah. I mean they are children. And but for me, Having children is like a totally different level. Then I can relate to my students who have children, demands of having children, the everything that comes with it, like life changes, relationship changes, and the fact that, oh, I need time to practice, I don't have time. But the things at some point, the practice is not sitting down and look really spiritual. And it's nice, I like my 10, 20 minutes in the morning in stillness myself doing my gratitude, doing my meditation, getting my thoughts together before the day begins like today. But on the other hand, once your practice evolves, it again permeates everything you do. I sit in the traffic lights and I just do, okay, that's two minutes and then you just drop into practice. So everything interweaves with each other. So I have the same, my students and people who are unpleasant to me are my best teachers as mm -hmm. well. <laughs> oh, that's a good way to, to see yeah. it, yeah. How did your practice evolve? Uh, now, what are you doing, able to do, or more confident to do than you wouldn't do at the beginning? More confident to do? Um, I think now, for me, I'm really confident doing a lot more physical practice, as in I'm not shy about, for example, I remember my first trip in the mountain, in the temple near Bhutan not long ago, and in the morning they do really intense physical exercise, and you're talking about young men okay. who are 12 <laughs> in to good shape. 30, in really good shape. Yeah. And for me, my body has changed a lot because like, I do a lot of things to them. I'm middle-aged, I had children, life has happened. 
But now I'm just like I feel that like okay, I could really get into it and not be self-conscious. Like okay, I have maybe it doesn't look that great. Get over yourself. Just get into it. And for me, and also the biggest challenge I had initially when I started the practice is to practice on my own. Really okay. Contest- wow. Because I love the group setting. Because when you have people meditating together, it really influences how you feel. If you drift a little bit, you go back into it really quick. And for me, the self practice is a thing that I'm. I have evolved a lot more of as I go further and further down the path. And the self practice have changed as well. It could be more spontaneous. It could involve movement. It could be just be still. And I'm not more not as prescriptive as I was young. Was I? I have to do my Vipassana now, an hour. I'm going to light this candle. I'm going to do my drifty, and I'm going to do my <laughs> soft focus, or I'm going to do the Tibetan flower. I'm going to look at the flower and really focus and do that. So I'm less, less focused meditation, more open awareness. Okay. So, ah, very interesting. Yeah, that's wow. the biggest development. You are also, um, we can talk now about the mental health issue because you are uh, teaching meditation Mm -hmm. in the psychiatric uh, world. Uh, Can you tell me more about this? Uh, How you came to do this? What's the Mm. story uh, of... uh it's really interesting. I think I took the job no one wants. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one, no? It's a hard one. It's yeah. my first job as a proper meditation teacher, just nothing else. And to be really honest, it's really hard for you. It's almost when you're teaching to people who are diagnosed with psychiatric disorders already, they are very sick. There's nothing glamorous about it at all. I mean, it's, they are on medication. Some of them can't even touch their toes. Some can't sleep. And some of them are under section two. So section two here means you're required to be in a mental health institution by law. The court has sent you here. Okay, okay. So wow. these are seriously so not an easy sick life. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of times I liken that to teaching people how to brush their teeth when you actually have cavities all over your teeth already. Yeah. So it's but it never goes to waste. And for me, it really makes me a much better teacher. I remember my first day before we start teaching, we have to do these hazard awareness uh, exercises. We have to put our hair up, wear neutral colors. We know where our panic alarm is. Um, Yes, Um, and then we already sit next to the door. We know where access is. We read all the patient notes. And I was ready to teach my first class. And I was like, okay, I was like, do all my checklist. And I was like, okay, I'm ready. I know my sequence where I'm gonna guide them. And then I opened the door and there some of them have chaperones and people standing like at the back of the room with nurses because they are a little bit more in what we call them low intensity, which means actually they're very intense. So I go into the room and my jaws just drop because they look absolutely normal to me. Okay. <laughs> it's just like I'm walking. You were expecting like I something was expecting like from a movie, like from a movie yeah, or yeah. something okay. that is very dramatic. I thought that would be something that would impact me once I they look like every day you walk into the office. Yeah. Or in a tube or in a train. And you realize how entrenched a lot of people could be so unwell and you can't see it. And for me, I that was a very moving moment for me. Wow. That means you can there's so much suffering. Yeah. That is totally undetectable. And these are very sick people, not just sort of like people with sort of more mild level these people require hospitalization and they're staying there for weeks and months on end. And so that opens my eye to what mental health means, what the mental health epidemic we are currently having, and let's call it, don't call it anything else, we do have a mental health issue. Really, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. especially after the pandemic. So, I mean, um, for me, then that's why there's been a focus of my work, helping people to do the work before it gets to such an extent that you require hospitalization and very intense medical intervention. There's a lot of things, practices that you could do. And a lot of patients after the class or session, they come to me and say, Athena, why don't I know this 10 years ago? Yeah. Why don't I do this for my children now that will save them a lot of angst in the teenage years? Why didn't I know about this when I was in my 20s, when I was like literally when my face down in the gusses? Yeah, so you, you, fix, you help people like to yeah. fix their anxieties a lot. 
anxieties, depression, PTSD, bipolar, schizophrenia, EDU, which is the eating disorder unit, so you name it, there is like, and for me, it's being exposed to this wide range of conditions that we have names for, medical names for now. And yeah. they all stem from the fact that while I'm sure you have interviewed a lot of people saying the divine within, your best teacher is within, your, be your, your worst demon is also within. Yeah, yeah, true. So yeah. that showed me the worst demon within and what to do about it. Do you have like one story to share where you could, uh, that touched you or where you could see that someone really improved or that you were desperate, emotionally desperate because you thought you, you were helpless? Do you have one story to share in this uh, psychiatric world? Well, for me, I mean, I go to work, it's work for me. It's like you go to work every day. So I never really quite know. I, while I could sort of see maybe what impact it has, you never quite know what happens afterwards. Sometimes yeah. patients come, patients go, there's confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So for me, okay, I go through, I, t I've been, I, was, I had teach there two, three years. So, and then I moved on. I was not on the ward all the time. I was teaching more privately in addiction rehab centers and things like that. So I was teaching a lot less and then gradually sort of moved on. And then one day on Instagram, <laughs> wonderful social media actually does a lot of things for us. I was posting about something and then there's this message come through from an account, I don't know, but it's a genuine, authentic account. She said, Athena, I don't know whether you remember me. I was a patient at the hospital and I want to thank you for the session you gave me every weekend for the one month I was there. She was diagnosed with severe depression, PTSD. She had a very traumatic upbringing and she was undergo she was in an, in a very complex sort of prescription she has a lot of drugs on and she was was also a young mother and couldn't couldn't really look after her child okay. so her child has been taken away from her and she was in a real dark place and she said Athena I didn't even say hello to you because sometimes patients come in and they are not in that place to perhaps engage and there also sometimes we talk but Sometimes they don't even sort of like, they come in and they go out, and I totally respect that. She said, I think now, I just want you to let you know that my life has totally changed. I keep doing what we practice. Wow, okay. She said, because it's the one thing that helped me the most. Of course, everything else helped as well. When you're in that situation, we throw everything at you. So art therapy, all the things that we mm -hmm. do yeah. on top of medical help. And she said, look, Athena, now, I have a new relationship, I have a new life in the country with a house, I have a new job, I just want to let you know I'm well. Yeah, that's good. And, that was yeah. <laughs> and for Bye. me, I cry. Bye. I really did cry. Bye. Bye. So for me, that was wonderful. Wow, well done, Athena. No, yeah, that's <laughs> why we do what we do. Yeah, well, congratulations. And do you think, um, psychedelic or mushrooms combine well with your, uh, um, with your practice, could combine well in the case of men severe mental health issues and not so severe, or is that Well, the scientific yeah. studies are coming out that gives sort of more assurances that this could help, but anecdotally I've seen it work really well in combination. So, but it's still a field that we need to explore more. And I've seen patients who sort of after their whole formal medical treatment came and said, look, ongoing, sometimes when I microdose, when I take X, Y, Z, I don't want to name it because once people are listening to it, to it in podcasts, the first thing they do is they Google it, <laughs> buy it off Amazon. That's <laughs> okay. the last thing you want okay. to do. But anecdotally, yeah. I think there's a lot of scientific evidence and I've seen, it, uh, I've seen it working. So it's very heartening. And I've seen like other therapies like ketamine helps. And it's, I think we are, because of the awareness now we have, a lot more help and a lot more scientific, res a lot more, of more funding has been channeling into scientific research, into all of these alternative therapies, uh, therapies and things that we could help in terms of mental health, whether it's maintenance, whether it's remedial, or whether it's just stressing symptoms on its own. So I liken the fact that one of the psychiatric, one of the doctors on the psychiatric wards tell me 10 years ago, not even 10 years ago, treating mental illness with drugs is a bit like doing a lobotomy with a saw. But now we have more and more sort of studies, more and more um, 
knowledge coming through and more and more evidence as well. So what you need is evidence-based yeah. therapies. And then, well, I think we, are, we have a lot to look forward to. How yeah. do you to, to uh, cultivate your positive thoughts? My positive thoughts? Yeah, I every think day. <laughs> cultivating positive thoughts. Yeah. I think <laughs> positive thoughts come when you are in the right place, when you are the, your mind is okay. in the right place. When you already did the meditation, <laughs> then that, they come yes. to you. <laughs> I think well. it's very, for me, um, it's the practice. Just do the practice. I have, I mean, I have my own views about good vibes only. I think a lot of positive Force positivity could be very toxic as well because you're brushing things under. Okay. And it's part of the work we're doing with Dr. Yeah. Gabor, as in you have to yeah. acknowledge the pain. Yeah. You have look at the darkness for us and be aware of the trauma and everything. So let me dark, dark thoughts happen. That's why you know you have good thoughts. It's yeah. the duality of life again. Wow. So I think do the practice, whatever the practice means for you. Yeah. Where does the name, uh, I think it's a fabulous name, the Gone Girl, uh, did, you f did you find it or someone found it for you? How did it come to How you? did it come? Yeah. Um, I think it comes in the early days when I'm teaching. I keep introducing to every myself to everyone, I'm Athena Ko, I'm Athena Ko. And they're like, cannot connect the name to me at all. And I'm sure most of us have problems with names. <laughs> and and um, yeah. yes, for me, because I, I don't look like my name. Athena is a Greek name. And obviously, I'm an East Asian girl. <laughs> and Ko is an unusual surname yeah. as well. So and then people start referring me to the Gong girl, like, you know, the girl, the Gong girl that came in the other day. So I was like, wow, why not brand it as a Gone Girl? It's easy, it's accessible. It's not overwhelming people with all these knowledge and study and you have to be, this is the path. This is like, I'm, I'm not here to enlighten you. Is there's a lot of very rigorous stuff going on at the background and as students progress, they're like, oh my God, Athena, so much behind this. But I think the Gone Girl is accessible. It's yeah. easy to find and it's, I could be anyone. There you it go. has something playful in it that matches it, with you, I think. It yeah, is. I mean, yeah. don't take yourself too seriously. I mean, I could drop into that personality when, like, I could play the PPE jargon, then I could do the whole, like, I mean, Harvard Business School, let's talk business, and I could... That's all in my training. But I think the more I get through the journey, the more I strip back of all of those things. And let's get to the truth of the matter. The truth is always simple. And the most enlightening thing that you can ever quote from any teacher that you might like is always the simplest quote because yeah. that's the one you yeah. remember yeah yeah so last question Athena um, the harvest of the day question I'm asking to everyone but I'm sure you had it like uh, it's not going to be <laughs> tricky for you because it's oh um, bring it on <laughs> no 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 don't worry it's what's your favorite tool to actively uh, transform our society our planet or ourselves just breathe just have one moment of stillness okay. every day. For how long? As long as you can, maybe five seconds. In our culture, we see silence. If I stop talking now, you'll get anxious. You're like, oh. Totally, totally, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We regard it as an empty space, as a void, as something awkward. We need to fill it up with chat, with scrolling, with activity with something to fill up that space. Yeah. And that's how we've been conditioned. So unwind that conditioning. Just drop in the stillness. Be still, be quiet. And then you find that, oh, this is really nice. Yeah. And then you start listening to what's really true to you, what your heart tells you. And that's where you find purpose. You find love. The most important love, what love that emanates from within, so you can love other people, and other people knows how to love you. That's where you find compassion, peace. Nice. One moment of stillness. You can do it while you're walking too. You can be have that moment of stillness while you walk. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So like right. walking meditation is a big, right. big practice oh, okay. amongst monks and people in the spiritual path. So, but you just try not to think about anything, or no, don't even try. Don't even try. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect, perfect stillness. Right. Perfect stillness, perfect peace, just quietness. Whether you're walking, if there's bird song, whatever, just allow it. Just peace, just a moment of stillness, no matter how long. 
mm. how long, however long you can master before it becomes an NC and you're fighting it, yeah, then, then yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. the practice. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an amazing tool. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Athena. For having me. And, um, what a way to start a morning. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, have a really good rest of the day and I'll see you at the event. You too. Thanks for doing a uh, gong bath to, uh, God, to people excited. of uh, Harvest in London. Thank you yeah. so much.